On this week's 51%, the Supreme Court has officially overturned Roe v. Wade. We speak with law professor Vincent Bonventri about what this means for the court and hear from advocates on both sides of the aisle. What this does is cut people who can get pregnant off from being free and equal citizens in this nation. And Albany Medical Center's Dr. Rachel Flink breaks down how to pick a birth control that's best for you. Coming up on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie. The whole world was a movie back then. I had my sunglasses on, I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh or Lita. I wasn't really in it. I didn't really get it. You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jesse King. On June 24th, the Supreme Court overturned two landmark decisions on abortion rights, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, as part of its ruling on Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. The ruling was made by the court's conservative majority, 6-3, to three, with a majority opinion by Justice Samuel Alito. The result, nearly 50 years after Roe was decided, was the end of constitutional protections for abortion in the United States. The issue of abortion has essentially been handed back to the states, roughly half of which are expected to greatly restrict or outright ban the procedure. In addition, a concurring opinion by Justice Clarence Thomas suggested he'd like to revisit cases tied to other rights, including gay marriage and contraception. The Supreme Court's flip on Roe v. Wade has been a long time coming. After all, opponents of abortion have been pushing for Roe to be overturned for decades. The court has grown increasingly conservative in recent years following appointments by former President Donald Trump. And we even got a preview of the decision back in May, when a draft of Alito's opinion leaked to the public. Still, the outcry, or praise depending on where you stand on the issue, has been monumental. I'm going to put down this microphone so I do not blow everyone's eardrums out. Instead, I am going to just raise up my hand, do a little one, two, three, and we're going to rage scream, all right? It won't be weird. You know, you got to do it with us. Yeah. Today, we're bringing you some of those reactions, starting with a Say Abortion vigil organized by Upper Hudson Planned Parenthood in upstate New York. Now, abortion rights are pretty well protected in New York. The state codified Roe into state law in 2019, and Governor Kathy Hochul has signed multiple measures increasing support for both abortion providers and patients who may end up coming to New York from other more restrictive states. But on the evening Roe was overturned, roughly 500 people turned out for the vigil in Albany's West Capitol Park. Protesters brought signs reading, keep your politics off my body, and wore stickers promoting Planned Parenthood. Aside from the screaming, it was a more somber event. Instead of chanting and taking to the streets, the crowd gathered around an open mic in the shadow of the state capitol, lighting pink candles as the night grew dark. I just am so angry, and I was talking to my therapist yesterday and telling him that I have so much unresolved anger, and I was thinking today, like, I need to do something with this. I can't keep sitting in my life and allowing people to victimize me and people more vulnerable than me. My name's Mickey, and I shouldn't have to be here right now at all. But since I'm here, um, I figured I would talk about my story, because if we treat abortion like it's illegal, it's going to stay illegal. I'm from Indiana. Yeah, I know. I don't like Mike Pence either. I had an abortion in 2016. I was 19. It was a bad situation. I don't owe you the details, but it happened. I didn't get a sex education in Indiana. PSA for the big girls, plan B does not work over a certain weight limit. I learned that the hard way. So yeah, that happened. Now I'm here before all the other 19 year olds that may not know that to speak for them when I wanted someone to speak for me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eden. I'm 18 years old. I graduated high school a couple of days ago and in like two months I'm going to college in Ohio. I will not have access to this service that I need. And I'm not a woman. I am transgender, I'm genderqueer, I'm non-binary, my pronouns are they, them, and that is non-negotiable. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm tired 
of the people who are only speaking out because this is a women's issue. This is not just a women's issue. I'm a pastor in the Christian tradition that celebrates a God who brings people into freedom out of slavery. What this does is cut people who can get pregnant off from being free and equal citizens in this nation. And that is wrong. So do not give in to anyone saying that this is good because it's about freedom. It is, has nothing to do with freedom except for the freedom of others. It cuts half of, at least half of the population away from being free and independent and equal citizens in this country. Thank you very much. Colonization and gentrification, imprisonment, migration, and militarization, homophobia and transphobic aggression, violence by police, reproductive oppression. But from the pain we will open eyes, awaken hearts and awaken minds, and our demands we intensify. Strategically, we are organized. Together we can raise the vibration through our action and imagination. Respect, trust, and communication, and love for our future generation. Intersectional inclusive we come. Collective power is how this is won. We keep it rising like the fire of the sun. We will rise like the sun. We will rise like the sun. In their dissent to the ruling, Justices Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan wrote, quote, "...with sorrow for this court, but more for the many millions of American women who have today lost a fundamental constitutional protection, we dissent." End quote. So what does this decision mean for the court? I spoke with Albany Law School professor Vincent Bonventry back in May, shortly after the draft of the Dobbs opinion was leaked in Politico. It doesn't appear the justices were at all swayed by the weeks of protests and outcry that followed the leak, as the final opinion released by the court closely resembles Alito's draft. Bonventry says he expected to see the court side with Mississippi and curtail Roe in some way, shape or form, but he was startled to see Roe completely overturned. Calling Alito's approach dogmatic, he worries about what he says is a lack of nuance in the decision. The two basic strands of his analysis that a right to choose is nowhere mentioned in the Constitution, number one, and then number two, it's not part of the history and tradition of this country. Those two, he insists uh, as though they are absolutes. They're not absolutes. In fact, the first one, the textual requirement, is absolutely preposterous. We almost didn't have a Bill of Rights because the framers were so worried that somebody would make that argument. If any rights were listed in the Constitution, they were afraid people would make this crazy argument, well, then the people don't have anything other than what's listed. And then the other one, history and tradition, are you serious? None of our landmarks would have been rendered if history and tradition were required. But he treats those two as though they're absolutes. And that's what really puts so many other landmarks at risk. If he and the five, if they're serious about those two requirements. There have been some concerns that this decision could lead to the erosion of other rights, such as gay marriage. Do you feel that could be the case? Well, first of all, let's look at the two justices that Alito is so fond of, in his opinion. Uh, One of them is Byron White. Okay, Byron White, in my own view, one of the worst justices ever on the court. Byron White was the author of Bowers versus Hardwick, which said that, you know, Georgia and the other states could throw people in jail for being gay and lesbian. Okay, specifically for, as Byron White would say, engaging in homosexual sodomy. And Byron White insisted in that opinion that there was no fundamental right to homosexual sodomy, right? That's how we phrase the issue in the case, whether the constitution confers a right of homosexual sodomy, right? As opposed to whether it's the government's any darn legitimate business in interfering with that. But then he says homosexual sodomy is not mentioned in the constitution, right? And certainly there has been no history and tradition of protecting a right of homosexual sodomy. Well, Alito quotes Byron White quite a bit, and he relies on that argumentation. 
The other justice that he cites is Scalia. Oh, and Scalia, first of all, was vehemently opposed to gay rights, but Scalia was also vehemently opposed to women's rights. In fact, insisted until his death that women were not protected by equal protection under the constitution. Why? Well, because that was not part of the history and tradition of this country. And of course it wasn't because it was not until 1971, that's usually a shock to my students. It was not until 1971 in Reed versus Reed that the United States Supreme Court finally declared that discrimination against women on the basis of their sex was arbitrary. That was the first time, 1971. So history and tradition, no, out the window go women's rights as well. Yeah, so uh, people have a right and a good reason to be very frightened by this draft opinion. There's also been a lot of talk about the politicization of the court, and it's made me think, like, where do we go from here? Are there any remedies for that, or is this just how it is now? Well, to add some perspective, the court's always been political. Now, um, first of all, the kinds of issues that come before the court are, you know, law and order versus rights of the accused, the rights of the individual versus the interests of society, right? What government's allowed to do, what the individual should be free to do. So those are always political questions. At the very beginning of the Republic, you know, under Chief Justice John Marshall, he was a very partisan federalist. What that meant was, to the chagrin and anger of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, what that meant was that the Supreme Court at the time kept protecting business interests and urban interests, right? Commercial interests, right? Also uh, in the late 1800s and in the early New Deal, the court continually invalidated all kinds of social justice, all kinds of social justice, social welfare legislation, because they were very conservative in the sense of protecting business, ensuring the laissez-faire, the free market. But then of course, in the 1960s, right, the court was kind of the other way. One of the very few times in our history, by the way, they in the 1960s, and actually right after 1954, when the court decided Brown versus Board of Education after Earl Warren became the chief justice, the court repeatedly began to, oh, overrule precedents and protect all kinds of fundamental rights. Virtually all the rights of the accused were made applicable to the states through the 14th Amendment because the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to the states, the 14th Amendment does. And also protecting all the civil liberties and civil rights. That happened, right? Beginning in 1954 through the 1960s and maybe a couple of years into the 70s. So. The court was very political then as well. The difference now, the real difference now is it's so partisan. If you think about how does a Republican politician usually vote? How does a liberal democratic politician usually vote? That's the way these justices have been voting. So if they're appointed by a democratic president, they tend to vote, I mean, almost overwhelmingly like a liberal, Democratic politician. If they've been appointed by a Republican president, they vote like a conservative Republican politician. That's what is so disappointing, disconcerting about the current court. A little while back, I spoke with former U.S. District Court Judge Nancy Gertner, and she mentioned that she was for expanding the court. I know Democratic lawmakers have also brought up other ideas in the past year or so, such as eliminating the filibuster. Legally, is there any precedent for these things at all? You know, with regard to the current number of justices nine, there's no magic to that. I'm aware of absolutely no study that suggests that's the best way to achieve justice or good reasoning and analysis. And, you know, uh, the Supreme Court's numbers have changed from the beginning, whether it was six, and then they wanted to make sure Jefferson, the Federalists wanted to make sure Jefferson didn't get to appoint anybody. So they shrunk the court down to five. But then later on, it was expanded to seven, then up to 10, and then ultimately back to nine, and it's remained at nine. I don't know. You know, if the Democrats change the number, then the Republicans, when they're in power, they'll change the number. I'm not sure what that does. Look, 
Jesse, if the people who are responsible for placing judges or justices on courts, whether it's the Supreme Court of the United States or whether it's our high court in New York, the Court of Appeals, if though the appointing authorities don't care about having a really good court, we will not have a good court. If all they care about is how are you gonna vote on a particular issue? Are you gonna vote like conservative Republicans want you to vote? Are you gonna vote like liberal Democrats want you to, to vote? Then you're gonna have a rotten court. And that's why the Supreme Court today is not a good court. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. That was all the questions that I had for you, but is there anything that I'm missing that you'd like our listeners to know? No, I, I, th I think that for both sides of the issue, woman's right to choose. I mean, some subtlety, some thoughtfulness is really required. And we need to stop being so blind about the interests that others are advocating because, there, again, there are two profound competing interests here. I mean, I'm for a right to choose, but I'm not going to be blind to the fact that there aren't profound interests on the other side. Vincent Bonventry is the Justice Robert H. Jackson Distinguished Professor of Law at Albany Law School. Vin, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for inviting me, Jesse. As Bonventry said, the discussion around abortion is heated on both sides. An NPR PBS NewsHour and Marist poll conducted after the ruling found 56 percent of Americans opposed the court's decision, but 40 percent, including 38 percent of women, agree with it. The Supreme Court's decision hasn't settled the debate so much as it has fanned the flames. Right now, trigger bans in many red states are starting to kick in, while blue states are ramping up protections for abortion. In Vermont, the Dobbs decision has no direct impact on state residents, as abortion access is legal in the state. But Vermonters will be taking the issue to the polls this November, as Vermont is one of the first states in the country that is considering an amendment to its constitution to protect abortion rights. On the day of the Dobbs decision, WAMC's Pat Bradley spoke with Mary Han Beerworth, executive director of Vermont Right to Life, about why she opposes the amendment and why she feels the court got Dobbs right. How much of a reaction are you expecting in the wake of this decision, especially since we kind of had a preview a few weeks ago when we mm -hmm. had the the leak of the draft decision? Do you anticipate a large reaction to this? Yes, and, and it will be a sort of sky is falling reaction here in Vermont because it's very important for listeners to understand that Vermont in 2019, by legislative action signed by Governor Phil Scott, legalized abortion in statute through all nine months of pregnancy, no limits, no regulations, an unborn child has no rights under Vermont law. And it's interesting, and I try to mention when I can, 215 plants and animals in Vermont have legal protection, but an unborn child has zero protection under the law. The same forces, Planned Parenthood, and their uh, very far to the extreme left allies are pushing for an amendment to the Vermont Constitution, and that will be decided this November, to amend the Vermont Constitution to enshrine abortion in the Constitution so that we can never regulate or restrict abortion. And they are gearing up for an increase in abortion patients from uh, other neighboring states that do require parental notification and other um, restrictions on abortion. Mary, so we are citing that constitutional amendment today, and it's very important that they do not use today's decision to add to a, a level of panic that we need a constitutional amendment to already decided by statute that Vermont has unrestricted, unlimited abortion through all nine months of pregnancy by law. What do you make of the possibility of having a patchwork of abortion laws across the country? It properly belongs to the people of the states and their elected officials. So Mississippi will do what Mississippi will do. And if the residents of Mississippi don't like it, they need to vote out their, their legislators and put different people in. Uh, uh, I think this is the right way to handle it. It was an, a judicial overreach to declare in the first place in Roe v. Wade and, and Doe v. Bolton that, that the Supreme Court could make law from the bench. It goes back to the people to decide, and that's the proper way that abortion should be handled. Respect for human life in some states will be very strong. Uh, lack of respect for human life in Vermont is uh, very strong as well. 
And so abortion rights are secure here. And it's a lot of uh, Planned Parenthood stirring a pot so that they can get their donors, you know, cranked up and, and get their activists moving, but with really without merit. Well, I mean, regardless of which side you're on, doesn't having it state by state make the work harder? Uh, no, I, I think it I think it restores a proper perspective and balance that that's a human life in the womb. And I think we need to be saying and defending that life. Um, and so some states will step up and say, not in our state, we're going to defend human life throughout all nine months of pregnancy. We just had a nurse get kicked in the stomach here. She was eight months pregnant. And if that baby had, her baby girl had died as a result of that kick to the stomach, there would be no charges for that baby's death. The, the woman who kicked her would simply be charged with assault. That was Mary Han Beerworth, Executive Director of Vermont Right to Life, speaking with WAMC's Pat Bradley. The fall of Roe has many taking a closer look at their birth control and emergency contraception. For many people, understanding and practicing safe sex is going to be even more important going forward. And as mentioned earlier on in the show, Justice Thomas has said he'd like to revisit cases like Griswold v. Connecticut, which codified access to contraception without government restriction. And that has some worrying whether they should stock up on things like Plan B or talk to their doctor about getting an IUD. It's important to understand which birth control method is best for you and exactly how to use it. So to learn more, I spoke with Dr. Rachel Flink, Chief of Family Planning at Albany Medical Center. So birth control can be broken down kind of in a lot of different categories. Some people look at whether it has hormones or it doesn't, or whether it has different types of hormones. Other times you can look at it as whether it's something that's implanted into your body that just just kind of working all the time in the background, or whether there's something that you have to take every day or something that you have to use every time um, you have sex. And so there's really a lot of different ways to break it down um, in the U.S., The most common kind of birth control is the birth control pill, which I think everyone's at least a little bit familiar with. And then some of the longer acting options like the IUDs are becoming a little bit more common, um, but not not quite as widespread. To kind of walk through, I guess, maybe the ones that people don't know as much and how do they work? What are some of those types? Sure. So the most effective reversible options are the long acting ones, um, the IUDs, which stands for intrauterine device and the implant that goes in your arm. Um, And so there are two types of intrauterine devices. One of them has a little bit of hormone in it, and that hormone mostly stays right inside the uterus, so tends to make periods lighter and works for birth control just by being inside the uterus and preventing sperm from getting in. Um, But very little of the hormone actually makes it into the rest of your body. The other type of IUD doesn't have any hormone in it. It just uses copper, and the copper basically kills sperm on contact. That's the main way that it works. Um, But the copper IUD can actually make periods a little bit heavier or a little bit more crampy. Um, So for people who already have bad periods, that's usually not the one that we'd recommend. Um, And then the implant has a little bit of hormone in it that just kind of is there all the time, um, and it goes throughout the body, so it can cause... um, a little bit more kind of of hormonal effects throughout the body and can also cause some irregular bleeding. Um, But those methods are all over 99% effective for preventing pregnancy. When it comes to the IUD or the implant, is there any kind of preparation that you have to do as a patient in order to have those things put in? So for the implant, it's actually a pretty simple procedure. Um, We use numbing medication in the skin, which definitely burns a little bit. Um, But then it goes numb and then we kind of pop it in. Your arm is going to be pretty bruised for a few days. Um, But then once the bruising goes away, you know, you're kind of all set. Um, And the current implant that we have in the United States is called the Nexplanon. It's um, FDA approved for three years, although there's really good data that it's good for longer than that. And the company is actually studying it out for longer than that. Um, So we're hoping to have more data on that soon. Um, But the IUDs that go inside your, your uterus can be a more uncomfortable experience. So we definitely recommend kind of talking to your doctor or clinician ahead of time to make sure you know kind of what to expect. Um, Taking ibuprofen before your visit is really helpful. If you've had bad experiences with pelvic exams in the past or a history of trauma, that's a really important thing to bring up with your doctor ahead of time. Sometimes there are medications that we can give that can make the process a little bit smoother, although that can also sometimes 
delay being able to get the IUD. And so um, sometimes it's kind of weighing those those pros and cons against each other, but talking to your doctor and kind of letting them know where you're coming from so that you guys can come up with a, a good plan together. And how long does the IUD typically last? So they're, the hormonal IUDs um, are approved for right now between three and seven years. Um, and it just kind of depends on the dosage. There is one that's being studied out for longer as well, um, so we hope to have more data on that soon. And then the copper IUD is approved for 10 years um, and is probably good for more like 12 years based on the evidence. So how do you know, I guess, which option is the best for you? I mean, are there some, I guess, like health restrictions that come with some types of birth control? There definitely are. So I didn't talk as much about um, the shorter acting options like the pill. Um, In addition to the pill, there's also a patch and a vaginal ring that have similar hormones to what's in the pill. Those contain estrogen and progesterone. They can be really good for regulating your periods, making them lighter. They're good for your skin. Um, They're a little trickier because you have to take them more often. So there's an easier chance of forgetting to take something or having an issue at the pharmacy or something. Um, And then the other problem is that, or the other limitation, I should say, is that for birth control that has estrogen in it, there are more medical contraindications. So um, anybody with a history of blood clots, anybody with a history of really bad migraines, um, some other complications like really significant diabetes or high blood pressure, people with any of those conditions um, generally shouldn't use birth control that has estrogen in it. Luckily, there's also pills that only have progesterone, and then there's also a shot that only has progesterone. So there are some short-acting options that are still available for those people. I had a doctor once tell me that they didn't want to give me the shot because I was still pretty young and that they wouldn't recommend prolonged usage of the shot. Are there any kinds of birth control that I guess work better for different phases of your life? So unfortunately, in the past, I think when we think about teenagers, everyone tends to just want to give them the pill because it feels... I don't know, we're used to taking pills, it's short acting, it feels like an easy place to start. Of course, it's hard for anybody to remember to take a pill every day and keep track of things, and especially teenagers who may not have their own transportation to get to the pharmacy, may not have as much control over other aspects of their lives, it can be even more challenging. Um, but I think that there had been uh, a view that maybe teenagers shouldn't use the longer acting options, um, and now we have a lot of data that we know that those things are safe. We used to think that the shot could only be used for two years at a time, but now we have good data that you can continue using it basically as long as you want to, um, as long as you're, you know, eating a balanced diet and sort of taking other measures to make sure that you're healthy and your bones are healthy. Um, And similarly, with those long-acting options like IUDs and implants, no one used to offer them to teenagers, but now we know that they're very effective for teenagers and that a lot of them want them. So certainly if somebody wants those options, we should shouldn't be withholding them. Um, When it comes to emergency contraception or like plan B, how does that work? And I guess what exactly is it doing to prevent pregnancy? So emergency contraceptive pills, there's plan B. The other emergency contraceptive pill is called Ella. Um, Both of them are a pill that you can take up to five days after unprotected sex, and they work by preventing ovulation. So if you've already ovulated, they're not going to make any difference. And if you're not at the point in your cycle where you would be ovulating, they're also not going to make any any difference. Um, But if you just so happen to be within kind of the week before you're supposed to ovulate and you have unprotected sex and the sperm is going to be hanging around, it can prevent ovulation until after the sperm are no longer hanging around. And that's how they work to prevent pregnancy is just by kind of pushing out release of the eggs so that fertilization and conception never happen. And so that has to be taken within five days of unprotected sex. Are there any kinds of like things that can make it less effective? Absolutely. So um, Ella is a little bit more effective than Plan B kind of in general, especially if you're getting closer to ovulation. Um, If you are at above a BMI of about 25, um, Plan B can be less effective. Um, And Plan B is also a little bit less effective kind of further out. The most effective forms of emergency contraception are actually IUDs, mainly the copper one, although it does seem like the hormonal one is also effective for emergency contraception. Um, And those don't lose effectiveness at any point within the five days. Um, So unlike the pills that are more effective the sooner you take them, if you're on like day four, it's just as effective as it is on day one. How does Plan B differ from like a medication abortion? 
That's a really good question, and it's something that we hear a lot of lately. Um, so medication abortion works on a pregnancy that is already implanted and growing inside the uterus. Medication abortion is a two-step regimen. The first medication is mifepristone, and that kind of stops the pregnancy from growing and starts to sort of, I generally say, loosen the pregnancy from the inside of the uterus. And then the second medication is mesoprostol, and that's what causes your body to actually expel the pregnancy. Met- mifepristone and mesoprostol wouldn't work after unprotected sex because there's no implanted pregnancy and so there's no progesterone, there's no you know, uterine lining or anything that you're kind of worrying about at that point. Um, so they work really differently. The emergency contraception works before conception and medication abortion works after implantation. What do you feel that I guess most people misunderstand about birth control and family planning? Is there any kind of like general advice that you would give for them? I would say one thing is this idea that um, that when you take hormones, that's something, you know, sort of different or unnatural for your body. Throughout the menstrual cycle, throughout the course of the month, our ovaries are making these different hormones and releasing them all the time. And you have these big hormone swings where the estrogen goes up and the progesterone goes up and then they go down and you kind of have, you know, premenstrual symptoms. Um, what hormonal birth control tends to do is just sort of level out that process so you have the same hormones that your body has all the time, but they're just at the same level every day. And so instead of one day being higher and one day being lower, they're just kind of consistent. There are absolutely people who do have side effects from being on hormonal birth control, and certainly they should talk to their doctors and see if there's a different option that would be better for them. But for the vast majority of users, they actually feel fine on hormonal birth control. And then when you stop it, those hormones go out of your system really quickly. Your body kind of picks up where it left off, and there's no long term effects. If someone is looking to, I guess, get an IUD, get an implant or get the pill even, like what's the process of getting these things? So I would always say to just start with your primary care doctor. There's a lot of primary care doctors, pediatricians, internal medicine doctors, family physicians um, that feel comfortable prescribing birth control. And so that, I think, is a good place to start, especially since they know your medical history and are probably pretty accessible to you if you see them for other care. Um, And if they think that there's something that's beyond their capabilities, then they can always refer you to OBGYN. If you don't have a primary care doctor or don't feel comfortable talking about this with them, um, then there's a lot of, you know, other clinics in the area. Planned Parenthood is certainly a common one that everyone has heard of and knows that they provide, you know, excellent reproductive health care and they tend to have sliding scale um, prices, especially for people who don't have insurance or who might be on their parents' insurance and don't want their parents to know that they're using birth control. Um, and so for those patients, you know, Planned Parenthood can be a good place to start. Um, you know, any academic medical center, you know, any OBGYN office certainly is capable of prescribing birth control. And you can always call your insurance company and find out, you know, who they cover in your area. So you're not going to get a big bill later. Dr. Rachel Flink is an OBGYN and the Chief of Family Planning at Albany Medical Center. Dr. Flink, thanks for speaking with me. No, I really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, share this and help more people out there take control of, you know, their fertility and their family planning and, you know, access what they want. You've been listening to 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. It's produced by me, Jesse King. Our executive producer is Dr. Ellen Shartok, and our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. Thanks to Vim Bonventry, Pat Bradley, Mary Han Beerworth, and Dr. Rachel Flink for taking part in this week's episode. To learn more about our guests and the show, check us out at WAMCpodcast.org. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at 51% Radio. Let us know what you think and if you have a story you'd like to share as well. Until next week, thanks for tuning in. I'm Jesse King for 51%. I was every single girl. I was nobody else. I was so sure of myself. I was 15 and a half. He was a hollow laugh. And I lost my cool somewhere along the way. The night bed on the hallway. Smile cool.